All right, guys, I'm going to run through Chapter 9 real quick. This is the second time I'm recording this because I forgot to plug in my mic the first time. So we're just going to run through just so you have an audio-visual example of all the stuff in the chapter, but we're going to go quick. Okay? You can pause it if you need to. So these are how our, our waters are divided. We have groundwater and surface water. For our groundwater, it's stuff that we're going to see in aquifers. Okay? So you have confined aquifers, something that if it's confined, it has impermeable rock. And we talked about porosity right, in our physical soil labs. Um, impermeable rock, we can drill into and they make artisanal wells. They recharge very slowly, so it can take tens of thousands of years to recharge. The good thing about that, though, is that it takes a long time for contaminants to get in. Bad thing, it takes a long time to clean contaminants out of them, because how do you get into something that's impermeable? Okay, unconfined aquifers, they recharge very quickly, but it's very easy to contaminate, and the water flows freely. Now, surface water, streams and rivers, ponds and lakes, wetlands, we talked about ecosystem services. Estuaries like marshes also do very similar things. So it's important to talk about the ecosystem services of these. Okay, usable water, um, about 3% of our water is fresh water, but of that fresh water, only 1% is able um, and readily drinkable because a lot of it is locked up here in this ice and glaciers. Okay, here it is, same fact. Right, water is important. It's important for biological functions. It keeps us alive, moderates climate, because the specific heat capacity of water is about 4,100 joules per gram degree Celsius. It's very easy, uh, or it's very difficult to heat up, but it's also very difficult to cool down, so it's a good moderator of temperature. It sculpts the lands through erosion, it removes and dilutes waste and pollutants, so if there's a problem with pH, salinity, or too much of a nutrient or another, the water can wash it away. That's what we're going to see in our labs this week. Okay, and if you're studying three and four for the practice test, you definitely need to connect what we're learning in this chapter with the hydrologic cycle from back in the day. <clears throat> okay, so what do we use water for? Mostly we use it for irrigation um, in our in agriculture. Next is industry, the coolant, the power plants, the cooling our machines. And then about 10% of it is used on domestic, just everything that you do at home. Remember, we had a conversation about this. If we're only using 10% of our water on you know, sewage ba and bathing, you know, is this really what we need to think about in terms of cutting down and trying to save water and not use up energy? The answer is yes, right? It's still yes. We still shouldn't waste any water because it is a precious resource. And here's the breakdown here. Now, when it comes to agriculture, plants and animals, we use about 11 times the amount of water to, cult to raise one cow. As it, as it does for a kilogram of wheat. So it's very, very important that we are meat conscientious. We don't overeat meat. We don't overconsume it because it has a huge carbon footprint. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of resources to raise it. Okay, here's some natural capital. You definitely need to know this slide because it talks about ecosystem resources, water, natural or current water. Recreation is one that a lot of people don't think about. The water is pretty, so I want to save nature. It has good effects because I like pretty water. It's awesome. Okay, scientific information is really important for water. Know that the, you know, the last final great frontier of the earth is in the ocean. So uh, if every time we just we, we research nature, we find things that help us. So it's good. It's good for us. Now, ground recharge works as a natural kind of like water sanitation, flood control, right? So if we have um, dry areas, wetlands will kind of go in and replenish the water. If it's too moist on like the dry land, go back out. I would go back and study the slide and draw it, but include it in your note card. The groundwater. Aquifers, small spaces found within permeable layers of rock and sediment. Water is found. Okay, so make sure you know these definitions. Unconfined, we talked about this. And confined, like impermeable rock or clay. And when we did our por uh, porosity lab, soil texture, you could see that there was a big difference in the rate of flow. So here's a picture of that confined aquifer. All right, unconfined aquifer. Uh, artisanal well, we drilled down and the pressure is relieved as the water shoot up. Here's just a well that goes into the water table. The water table is something that is below the ground. It comes up. The recharge area is an area where the water can fall back in. Notice that since this is impermeable, the only place for the recharge to come in for the confined aquifer is this open hole, right? Whereas the unconfined aquifer can get water through any part of this. All right, so here's our Edwards aquifer. 
There's a recharge zone here, contributing zone. This kind of pours down into like these other recharge zones. Artisanal zone. So what do you think we do here? Artisan zone. The groundwater. Water table is the uppermost level at which the water in the area fully saturates the rocky soil. What is recharge? Input process of water percolating into an aquifer. Springs or water from an aquifer naturally percolates up to the surface. An artisan well is a well under impermeable rock that will rise up due to the pressure in the surface. So what you need to know here is that spring and artisanal wells are a little bit different and kind of think about the reason why. Okay, a cone of depression. An area where there's no longer any groundwater. What will happen is the well will soak up the water from here. It'll pull this water this way, pull this water this way. And now look, the water table no longer reaches these wells. These wells have dried up. You can see this is kind of like a cone. It's an inverted cone. Kind of a bad picture, but you kind of get the point. All right, salt water intrusion. When pumping fresh water out of a well faster than it can recharge, the coastal area is going to find its own height. Remember, water seeks its own height, so the water level, its gradient. Okay, so the salt water is going to infiltrate this way. So the fresh water gets pumped out up this way. This stuff's going to all lower. And now look what's going to happen here. The salt water gets to make its way inland. All right, so that's what's happening. Depletion of groundwater can threaten the species who live in the aquifer or in the areas that are affected by cones of depression. So keep this in mind, human activities and controlling water, right? We need water to live, but if you don't take into account water levels and um, the types of biomes that exist with the amounts of water there, um, they can negatively affect species there. And we know that taking out even one species, if it happens to be a keystone, ends up um, affecting, having a cascade effect. Right, surface water, streams, rivers, ponds, lakes, and wetlands. Let's talk about these real quick. Productivity of a lake. Oligotrophic, low amounts of nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen. We know if we're studying our, our cycles, phosphorus is not H2O soluble. This is not H2O soluble. So it ends up being a very limiting factor. This is a limiting factor. Phosphorus in water ecosystems. Mesotropic, moderate level of productivity, and eutrophic is high levels of productivity. So remember that eutrophication, right? Relate that word eutrophication to eutrophic, right? Now, eutrophication is when you go way overboard and you have things like algal blooms, right? So kind of differentiate between um, eutrophic lakes and eutrophication of the lake, right? They're different. Okay, oligotrophic and eutrophic. See, look, there's actually, this is actually water. Okay, this is Algae on top of water. This is you want to swim in that? I don't think so. It's like green PVC. I don't want that. Right, natural capital of rivers. It delivers nutrients to the sea and helps sustain coastal coastal fisheries. So just think, all the nutrients that end, that end up in the sea come from land, right? And where does that stuff come from? The soil. It comes from things that die in there. It deposits silt that maintains deltas. They purify water, renew and renourish wetlands, and provide habitats for wildlife. So keep these things in mind. Service, anytime you see services, these are things that are going to be asked about biodiversity, about ecosystems. So make sure you know those. So too much water, is that a good thing? No. Ask these guys trying to pump their gas under four feet of water. It's not really that fun. Now, if you watch the guys in San Antonio, right, that had those floods a few years ago, they were kayaking down the stream. Didn't seem to be that big of a deal for them. Um, but it is not a good thing. <clears throat> they end up polluting things because um, the stuff that's on the land here gets out into, like, Water supply, not good. Too little water drought. It leads to soil erosion. Hydrophobic soil conditions and expanding deserts. And what's a really interesting thing about um, drought is that if you get this really crackly soil right here, it ends up becoming very, very impermeable. Right? It's really dry, it doesn't let water go in. So the next time that it does have like this really nice downpour, right? no red rain, blue rain, this water cannot penetrate to the surface, and it's just going to flow away and create stuff like this flooding. Okay, altering the availability of water, which we do all the time, here are some ways that we do it. Okay, we do levees. An enlarged bank built up on each side of the river prevents flooding around the river. So imagine that you had um, a stream that goes this, 
And so here are the banks, right? The water is able to flow like this. And if the water gets too high, guess what? The whole water level in general is going to raise up out of the screen, right? But if if you were to take these banks here, shift them, oh, that's terrible. Sorry. If you were to take these banks and shift them outward, well, now guess what? It's like getting a bigger container that you were pouring liquid into. Now it's going to take a lot longer for this water level to rise. And there are some downsides to that. Though. The dike, similar to levees, but built to prevent ocean. So this right here is for rivers. You're going to differentiate these, which we did in class. Oceans. Right? Let's talk about the downsides of these. We can even look these up on your own. A dams, a barrier that runs across a river, a stream to control the flow of water, which is really good because um, we can we can see that the water level is way up here. And now we can actually build stuff down here. But when these things break, it's bad for everyone, right? Dams, projects create jobs, but when they break, they flood and kill everybody here. It's awesome. Um, when we do decide to take dams down, which there are very famous examples of recently, we have to move people out of the way. So every time we have one of these like land projects where we're going to move water around, people have to move. The reservoir is an area where water is stored behind the dam. So this is the reservoir back here. Okay, let's see. Alter altering the availability of water. So here's a problem. The fish, obviously, that were originally going this way, no longer get over this wall. So you have to do something for them, otherwise you end up ruining the entire ecosystem. Right? These fish aren't just for us to eat on sushi, they are for things like bears and other large fish. So they really are important. Their fish poop ends up eutrophying the water and becoming very important for all the other environmental activities. Right? So what are some things that we can do to mitigate that problem? We can build fish ladders. It sounds really funny. It's a really funny image to think of a little fish. There's all little fish right here. Fish with his fins. And he is jumping. He's using the little ladder and he's climbing. Well, he, what he's going to do is he's going to zigzag. But before he could not get over this wall at all, now because he built the little fish ladder, he can. It's great. It's awesome. In aqueducts, um, and aqueducts are things that have been built for thousands of years by humans. And they're you know, amazing feats of, of engineering that bring water to places that they didn't, didn't exist before. And that's actually what an aqueduct primarily means. It's, uh, carries water from one location to another. And you can kind of break that apart. Aqua water duct or channel, I guess, a way for it to get through. Okay. The overdrawing surface water, the Aral Sea disaster, we kind of looked at this. I want you to see what they did here. Um, they altered the sea, this like really large lake in Russia, and look what happened here. Let's look at see what happened. So when they drained it out, you know, not all the nutrients went with it. Right? So. This is what it looked like in the 60s. As they drained it out into two, two streams, look what's happening to the water level up here. Watch, we're starting to see a big difference. All right, yeah, it's really fragmented, right? That's a really big thing that we should talk about. You have habitat fragmentation. That's a really common major effect of altering water systems and streams and lakes that you end up with a lot of habitat destruction and fragmentation. Okay, now in 2009, you can see there's a really, really big problem here. The water doesn't even look the same. The salinity here is off the charts. Pesticides that did go into the lake are no are now are not diluted with all the water that was before. So things that do live in here are going to be like radioactive three-eyed fish wanders, right? From like the Simpsons. Alright, so look at the so look at the difference here. And you can tell that there that, that's not good, right? I mean, it doesn't take a genius, it doesn't take a math surgeon to figure that out. That's not a good picture. All right. Devastating to the local people. So if we're talking about ecosystem effects, right? You can see that of course all the fish that used to live here are bad. They're done. But you can see that the effect on people and the economy, right? Look at these ships. You're not fishing anymore because the ships they don't have wheels, right? You can't you can't like row a boat through sand. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so what are some other options if we don't have enough water? You have desalination, which we talked about in those TED Talk videos. And there are a couple ways to do that. I think this is the distillery and the osmosis, the reverse osmosis method. 
in distillery, you just boil stuff off. The lighter water without salt will collect in these tubes, cool off, cool off, and then you'll end up keeping that um, water without without the salt in there. Reverse osmosis is just a concentration gradient. The high concentration of salt will go to where it's lower, so it will balance out. And you can actually, if you keep a semi-permeable membrane here, it will keep the salt on one side and the fresh water on the other. The downside to this though is you create a lot of brine, right? A lot of really high salt content water. And you can't just dump this anywhere because it will kill everything. Um, if you are a freshwater animal and then you get exposed to this, it's not good for you, right? With um, distillation, it takes a lot of energy to boil this stuff. It's not always practical. It's very expensive. All right, let's talk about some ways that we use water in agriculture. Furrow, flood, spray, and drip irrigation. These are actually the order of um, efficiency here. Four, this is the oldest, easiest way. Three, two, and one. Um, there are some pros and cons to each of these. I'd recommend that you look at those. Right, so furrow irrigation to trench flooded with water. Flood, the entire field is flooded. This can waterlog the plants. Spray irrigation is expensive and takes a lot of energy. Drip irrigation uses a slow dripping hose. This is really good. This is 95% better for efficiency. Hydroponic agriculture. Crops are grown in fertilized water with no soil. Good thing about this is that you use a lot less money on fertilizer. But you have to have a lot more technical skill to do this. All right, so what do we use? How do we use water with agriculture, industry, and household? So industry is the second largest use of water worldwide. I think you remember it's about 20% or something like that. So here are our nuclear power plants. They use water to cool off um, cool off fuel rods and things like that. So all this is steam. This isn't like pollutants or anything. It's just steam. But, um, if you look at the use of water in our households, you can see that there is a positive correlation with affluency, right? Like the more affluent these countries are, the more water we use. We don't need to flush with toilets anymore. We can just leave everything in there. But we should, you know, really save all the water. Save the whales, right? Just hold it in, guys. No pooping anymore. All right. So what are we going to do in the future? Water ownership. This is a really big thing with the California water wars. The um, absolute dominion in Maine. People have rights to water use, but they do not own the water. This is very difficult because if water starts like in a mountain, like ice, and you're like an ice cap here, and it melts, pours down a mountain, maybe people in like mountain land own this ice and water, but then people in like valley land down here, this is their land. So is this water theirs, or does it belong to these guys here? So it's a very, very important thing. And this is where the government comes in with legislation to kind of help decide who the right owners of water are and how it gets divvied up fairly. How do we conserve water so that we're able to actually survive? These are some ways here. You can watch that with the movie tab. Conservation. Here's some ways we do that. Recycling, conserving at home. We also had this idea of gray water, right? And I urge you to watch those videos on YouTube that I posted just using water that is lightly soiled, which doesn't sound that great because you're using more soil still. Um, but soil is good because we just did a chapter on soil, so that's, that makes it better, right? So as long as it's not from your toilet, your sink, your bathroom, or um, your washing machines, like your dishwashing machines, that have a lot of organic waste. You can reuse this water for things like watering your lawn, maybe even washing some clothes, some clothes, right? Like the like they do in Japan with those gray water washing machines. So gray water is a, one way that we can conserve water, and it doesn't use a lot of pesticides and detergents to purify. So that's kind of nice. So if we're thinking about developing nations, right? They're going through like maybe their second and third phase of industrialization. Some things that we may want to give them as advice are these ideas of gray water and making sure to build your cities with conservation in mind, right? It's really hard to just tell developing nation, like, oh, don't use any water. Um, but it's going to happen, right? So it's not a matter of if we use water. It's a matter of how and um, how to conserve it as best as possible. And remember, um, not drinking water isn't the answer. The answer is just not having a large population, right? That was, that was the, the lesson we could take away from all this. It's just get rid of, like, half the population, and, and we'll be good. But, of course, that doesn't, you can't do that in short scales. It's kind of neat. All right, guys. Bye-bye.